So hello to any early web, uh, webinar attendees. Is anyone there? Um, we've just gone live so that we can welcome you into uh, this ether space. Um, if anyone wants to say hi, you can actually just go to the chat um, feature down the bottom and um, we'll officially start in a few minutes. Anyone there? Anyone there? It's really different yeah. having it. Oh, there we go. So can you see it? We've got Brian. Hi. Hi, Brian. Hi, Claire. Antonio. Sue Ellen. Amy. I won't be able to keep up after a while. Oh, <laughs> Where are you Rachel Where are you Hi, Rachel. Oh, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> How come you can see that and I can't? <laughs> Brian Stall. We've got a Canadian. Uh, oh, uh, top of Montanan. Oh, cool. Oh, hi, Nicola. <laughs> We're checking in. 123 are coming in. There's more. I'm from Germany. Going in. Hi, Luke. <laughs> So just for everyone's interest, we've had over 700 people register. So um, um, not all of those people will be live today, but we are pretty pumped. Um, record numbers we're hearing. Hmm. And we thought that you're all sick of Zoom webinars. <laughs> but not webinars. Not webinars. This is the yeah. first webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Stephen from Sydney. So, for those of you who haven't used Zoom before, you'll see there is a Q and A button along the bottom of your screen, so you can ask questions as we go along there, and we will try and answer them as we go, as well as answering at the end of the session. But Rochelle will introduce that in a few minutes. But yeah, yeah. tell us. Yeah, say your highs in the chats and your questions in the Q and As. Mm -hmm. Hi Neil, doing? 175 participants already. <laughs> this is super cool. Classic. I want to see someone from WA. Hi Joe. Five o'clock in the morning there. Alberta. Must be one of your friends, Nicole. There we go, Christine from WA. Hi, Christine. Hi, Christine. Hi, Christine. Hello. Well done. Well done. Five o'clock. And I'm sorry. <laughs> We've got someone from Chile. Costa. Morning, Costa. <laughs> Costa from Gardening Australia. Now we feel special. <laughs> oh, that, that's pretty special. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Matt. Scotland, Andrew Simmers, no way. That's very cool. That must be um Greg Siegel from WA. Like nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night. Yeah. Hi Greg from WA. Bryce. <laughs> well we are do you want me to kick off? It's just hit seven and I'm sure that we're gonna use all of this time. So Happy Worms Day, everybody. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to our first webinar. So I'm Rochelle Armstrong from Nutrisol Biological Solutions, and we've got Nicola Matic here also from Nutrisol. So we got up early this morning to host this event with our good friend and fellow worm lover, Nicole Masters. She's New Zealand born, an agroecologist, and currently based in Montana, USA. Uh, we plan to have Nicole as our keynote speaker, as many of you may know, at our annual event in April in Wodonga. And we we're also going to have a three-day um, course. So, um, we were all very excited about these things. But they were, um, it was very unfortunate at the time that they had to be postponed. But in the, in the twist of events, we're really grateful that we can still do this and very excited about today's event. Um, and now we've got over 700 people registered with this Zoom technology. And I think that's, you know, one of those um, silver linings that we could, um, you know, have this unexpected event. So what we're saying before to those who've just come in, we, you've, 
we'd love you to say hi um, on the chat feature. There's two features here. So say hi and tell us where you're from because that's like really exciting for everyone. And um, there's a Q&A feature there as well. So that's for your questions. Obviously, um, with so many people, um, we can only sort of take questions through um, that, that format. Um, so we actually have 60 minutes presentation time for Nicole and then 30 minutes of um, Q&A time. So yeah, we won't be answering those questions as they come, but we'll, we'll definitely be trying to get there um, by the end of the time. So just to set the scene, um, for those who don't know us, um, we're at Nutrisol, we produce a worm liquid um, from great big worm farms or their worm beds shaped as windrows. Um, we're here all the time to answer questions on, you know, what we do and, and our worm liquids. So um, even, you know, we'll do uh, tours on request if you like. So all of that's possible and, um, you know, we're happy to, to answer questions anytime. So our purpose as a business is to empower farmers to produce life enriching food. Um, we have values around nurturing nature. So we sit back and let nature, you know, do its thing and it knows what it's doing. We support the leaders in natural farming and we strive to build the regenerative agriculture community. So that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. But today we are here to listen to Nicole. Um, we've known Nicole for many years and um, we've worked together more times than I can remember. <laughs> she, she has her own business um, called Integrity Soils um, where she shares her knowledge through education, um, bringing consultants also to help farmers to achieve transition to, to regenerative agriculture. She brings passion she brings science and integrity. <laughs> she certainly brings integrity to agriculture, which is very much needed these days. And for those who haven't read her book, For the Love of Soil, da, 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 da. Um, <laughs> do yourself a favour. <laughs> this is definitely a great read. And um, yeah, and you know, she's also got places on, you know, you can Google and find talks and things that she's done as well. But it's my pleasure now to hand over to Nicole of Integrity Soils. Morning, Nicole. Good, good afternoon, Rochelle. Uh, good looks afternoon. like it's good evening. Uh, the early worm is catching some people in Western Australia by the looks. I am so excited to see who's on this call. I feel, um, I feel quite overwhelmed, actually. I'm recognizing some of the names of people that have been involved in worms for them by the, you know, themselves for a long time. So I expect some pretty gnarly questions and I know for some of you, you know, this, I mean, who would have thought this is worms and it yet actually we're seeing this whole rise of people becoming very interested in how do we close the loops for ourselves. So I'm just going to kick things off and yeah, please feel free to use that Q&A button and ask questions as we, as we go along. So welcome to the worm power start to your day or end to your day if you're in Scotland and England by the looks. Um, so yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I don't need to say anything. Rochelle's just, just given me this amazing introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Rochelle. Um, but yeah, so I'm an agroecologist. I work um, around uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the US. And these days with COVID, um, I'm, I'm really just focusing on the top half, uh, west, western side of America. So right now you are in my mobile headquarters. <laughs> so this is my... Um, you're in my bedroom right now, just so you feel more intimate. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm living in a horse trailer with my horse and my puppy, who hopefully is going to stay asleep. Um, and yeah, we're, we're working with, with people in the US right now. Um, I have consultants that are based in Australia and New Zealand or coaches, and we're working with people in terms of, you know, how do we get to the next level? But it's really interesting, like in the past 22 years. This is how I started out. This is a photograph here of um, sort of a more industrial worm farm with my son, who must be about three or four at the time. Um, I, I did a degree in ecology. I majored in soil science and I promptly went and got pregnant, which is a really smart thing to do when you leave school. If you're not sure what you want to do, kids, there you go. Um, so I ended up back at the family farm um, had my son Bryn, who was just you know, such a treasure, and then was like, how do you find work? 
in rural communities when you're a single parent. And I was very, very fortunate in that my father helped me. We found this advert that said deceased worm farm estate and uh, we brought this worm farm business. Um, so we basically carted all the worm castings, all the equipment, and I started um, doing waste minimization. Picked up a contract here with Tauranga City Council that was a 10 year contract in helping or assisting people in reducing household waste. And in this process, I started to create um, what I thought was just a brilliant vermicast. So I was making a worm product that was quite fungal dominated, which we'll talk about and talk about why that can be quite challenging. Um, yeah, and I uh, at the time, well, still in New Zealand, marijuana is illegal, but uh, the hydroponic stores seem to really want vermicast. And I discovered later the reason for that was you know, it holds on to moisture, it provides nutrients through the growing season. And for a crop like marijuana, where you can't be checking on it, you can plant it in vermicast, walk away and then just come back at harvest time. So um, talking with the guys that were growing these crops, I became very interested in, okay, how do we create a, a more specific blend for different types of crops? And um, yeah, anyway, I, I never would have guessed that these kind of starts would, would have ended up me living in Montana and working with ranches. And we're currently working with over 1.2 1. 1. million acres um, throughout North America and Australasia, bringing vibrant life back, which um, is just incredibly exciting. So yeah, plug for the book. Thanks, Michelle. So if you haven't got a copy of this, it is available in major bookstores. It is on audio um, and on Kindle. I won't go on about so yes, why worms? So there's 340 of you on the call right now. So I think we are getting engaged in why is it that we want to be interested in worms or vermiculture. So it's a brilliant way to reduce effluent or other kinds of organic waste streams. If we make a good product, it is a superior inoculant in terms of microbiology. It could provide potential supplementary income and we can start to close the loops on inputs. And so many of producers that I've worked with have managed to do this. So there's no external inputs coming in in terms of um, fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, any of that jazz. So some of the benefits of vermicast. It is, and I talk about it um, in my classes, the elixir of life. So what comes out of a worm's butt is literally the elixir of life. You know, hundreds of millions of years unchanged because what worms do is perfect. So they basically poop out exactly what it is that soil and plants need. So plant available nutrients, vitamins and enzymes, full of natural antibiotics and plant growth hormones. They also contain humic acids and other soil conditioners. So humic acids, I think of them in terms of the very final breakdown of organic material, but they are your bank account. They are the hospital of the soil. It's really where, you know, the system really starts to work. And think of humic acids as long chain carbons. It's the currency of the planet, what makes the planet go round. So worms, hello, what's gonna be better than what comes out of a worm's butt really? Okay. So it's biologically alive. So it's full of beneficial fungi and bacteria. So including such organisms as your nitrogen fixing bacteria, things like trichoderma, which is a fungus that's very beneficial, um, phosphate solubilizing bacteria, some that produce antibiotics, some that produce plant growth promotant enzymes. It's a very rich source of nematodes and protozoa. And so these are your larger soil organisms. And what I find on many properties that we have a look at is you don't have these larger predators functional in your soil. And these are the ones that are responsible for cycling nutrients and releasing that to the plant. So if you're low in nematodes and protozoa, these are the soils that are called the constipated soils, right? Everything just becomes locked up in the bodies of your bacteria and not being released to the plant. So if we can be adding in nematodes and protozoa, we can help to kickstart that whole nutrient cycle. So one of the other things that I like about what's in vermicast is if we consider, what is it that makes it rain? So 40 to 100% of ice crystals that are up there right now, like if you look out this beautiful Montana sky and there's clouds, those clouds contain bacteria. Right, and one of those organisms is called Pseudomonas syringae. It makes ice nucleating, it's an ice nucleating bacteria. So what it does is it forms those ice crystals. What that means for us as producers is it also forms frost. So it forms those frost crystals on that leaf surface and creates frost damage. So we can reduce those frost factors by doing things like reducing your free nitrates. So not having a whole lot of free nitrogen in the system 
We can lift the sugars in the leaves, so that's your brick. So lifting plant photosynthesis reduces frost. We can increase biological activity on leaves and in the soil. And one of the organisms that does that is Pseudomonas florensins. Vermicast is full of Pseudomonas florensins. It can protect your plants from frost damage from as low as a minus six degrees Celsius or 21 degree Fahrenheit event for two months. So we're using worm extracts as a frost um, reducer. So we're actually spraying them on as a foliar in viticulture and horticulture and um, frost, frost susceptible crops. So actually using a worm extract to help with that. Worm extracts are also helpful for hydrophobic conditions. So hydrophobic means literally your soils are afraid of water. Um, you don't want soils that are afraid of water. And what we're seeing is this is happening across millions of acres in Western Australia. Um, I've just been on properties around Montana and we're seeing this on multiple properties. So you do the infiltration test and have a look. Is your soil afraid of water? Now those hydrophobic conditions can be byproducts of what we call the volatile organic compounds that come off plant material. So it could be, um, and you'll notice around eucalyptus trees, they're notorious for it. Um, some pine uh, conifer species produce these organic compounds. They aggregate around the soil particles and they can move through the soil and make these um, hydrophobic conditions. Hot fires will also create these hydrophobic conditions. Um, and when soils get super, super dry, then your bacteria will actually make waxes that then make soils water repellent. So there's a biological component in that. So in that worm's butt or the elixir of life, there are microbes which eat the hydrophobic coatings. So the Pseudomonas florensins, Ceratia species and Bacillus species will actually chew away and eat up those hydrophobic coatings. So get interested, do your infiltration test and have a look. Do I have this condition happening in my soil? So there's tens of thousands of signaling molecules in soils. So there's proteins and hormones, enzymes, and different types of elicitors that basically, if you think about it, the soil and the plants and microbiology are communicating all the time. Like if you could like listen in, it's an absolute racket of chatter, of communication. And many of the plant defense molecules, so like salicylic acid, jasmonic acids, chitinase, proteinase, these things are produced as a byproduct of some of these signaling molecules. So it's a, it's a microbial stimulus that helps that plant produce these plant defense molecules inside of it, right? So think about that system, like it's just humming and it's full of these different signaling molecules. Part of this is what we call the quorum sensing and many of you have probably heard this before. So quorum sensing is the signals which turn biology on or if they're turning it off, it's uh, quorum quenching. So it's something that ants and honeybees do um, your inflorescent, uh, like plankton and things in the seas, that's what they do. And it's what we're discovering is happening between plants and microbes. And it really is the new frontier of discovery around soil and about the human gut microbiome. Um, yeah, and so if you're not learning this at university, you're going to have to say to your professors, we need to be studying, we need to be looking at this because this really is a, where we're going in terms of, the, of understanding soil, all right? It's all about parts per trillion molecular signaling to turn things on or turn things off, right? So the plant's communicating to microbiology and microbes are communicating back to the plant. So these signals are all through soil and especially in healthy soils. So we could be looking at a 20 fold increase in these signaling molecules in healthy soils compared to soils that have been overgrazed or are full of chemicals. So if you take the plant, if you look at, split the plant in half and look on the left hand side, if, if that plant's been compromised and it doesn't have the microbial community, so in this case, it's the trichoderma, so that's that fungi that eats fungus. If you don't have trichoderma in the system, so say you have been using a lot of ag chemicals or tillage, um, then you can have a compromised system. And what happens is that plant is attacked by something like botrytis. It sends a signal to the microbiology, microbiology don't respond, the plant gets sick. If, however, trichoderma is in the system, the plant sends a signal out its root systems and the trichoderma responds with its eliciting and, and uh, chemical molecules and the hormones are primed. So here's your jasmonic, ethylene, salicylic, abscisic, and the peptide, prosystamine. These are all produced in the plant in response to the trichoderma. So all of these molecules that we, all these hormones that we know that are so essential for plant defense, 
the, the plant doesn't do it by itself. It does it in relationship with microbiology. So I often think of like the plant's root system and that soil system. It's like it's outsourcing its stomach. It's outsourcing its immune system. All of the functions that we think of as so important inside our body, the plants actually have it outside of their bodies. And they do that in relationship to microbiology. So it's absolutely essential that we have a diverse and vibrant biological community so that plant can be communicating and building up its system. I love this example and I know Nutrisoil, this is one of your clients and you guys have been, have you seen this? Did you see, did you see this in action? No. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be out there when this happened. So uh, this is um, Di and Ian Haggerty's property in Western Australia. What they use is five litres or half a gallon an acre of Nutrisoil, which they're putting with the seed. And then they're doing 120 litres of a compost extract with the Nutrisoil on it as a foliar. That's right, isn't it, Michelle? Yep. Right, so what they notice, so they took, they're taking on very degraded land and they're finding that their land is, that they're acquiring is, is becoming more and more because people are wanting to see this rehabilitation happening out in Western Australia. So after their first year of doing this application, you know, they grew a great crop. So they've come in, they've harvested the crop and then in summer is when it's Western Australia's downtime. Um, and typically, you know, there's not a lot of stuff growing and if it does grow, it's weeds. So in their first year, what they saw were the button grasses, the kerosene grass and the windmill grasses. So you're thinking kerosene grass doesn't sound good in Western Australia. Uh, windmill grass, I've also been told, is known as crack grass. This grass <laughs> climbs up the back of your leg until it comes out your crack. Nice one, Australians. <laughs> um, and I had that happen. So it's actually true. Um, and so they didn't hurt. They didn't herbicide or try and keep um, bare fallow over summer. They were just happy to have ground cover. So they allowed those early successional grasses to cover the ground. Then they come in with their, um, their grain crops. So they're planting oats or wheat. So down those rows, they're doing the treatment. And in the second year after the crop is harvest, so look down these rows, what you're looking at is down the furrow went that Nutrisoil product and then on the foliar went the, the compost extract in the growing season. They've harvested it. They got a, um, a summer rain came through and what came up was serrati species. So these are native C4 palatable grasses that um, the Haggerty say they haven't seen for 60 years. When we looked around the region, so this, was, this happened across thousands of acres across their properties. It did not happen at the neighbors, all right? What you're seeing here is a germination response into those biological signals. So the microbiology is signaling that seed bank to germinate. So I want you to consider whatever you see growing on your property is a response to these signals. So if you're seeing some kind of weedy species encroaching or very low palatable grasses um, or less persistence of something, it's because of the signal that you're providing through your management or your inputs or whatever you're doing with grazing, right? So whatever you're doing above ground is influencing below ground to set the signal for who germinates. So start to consider, all right, was it just climactic? Um, was it just the weather patterns? Or actually, do you notice things change along the fence line? And what I think you'll find is what germinates does change along fence lines. So we're in a, an arms race, right? So modern agriculture is putting us onto this exponential arms race. So herbicides, we now have over 300 weed species that are herbicide resistant, over 500 pests, pests that are pesticide resistant, antimicrobial resistance, and everything's on this exponential rise. So obviously we need a bigger hammer, don't we? We need to genetically engineer a dicamba with a 2,4-D, um, I don't know, and some kind of nuclear explosion because that's where we're heading in terms of what do we have as tools to be able to control these things. What's happening at the Haggerty's property is this. So look at this, if you look at this graph, what it's showing is herbicide resistance in ryegrass. So Prospect is the name of their property. So they sent in samples of soil and seed bank taken from um, where they'd been doing treatments and then soil from just outside that hadn't been receiving any of the Nutrisoil or the compost extract. So that soil that's been treated, um, the, the ryegrass seed bank in there is now being killed at half the rate. And this is what they're finding is they can use less and less herbicide. Herbicides are not 
well, weeds are not due to a herbicide resistance. Weeds are, are happening because of the micro. signal that's being sent right and we can change properties we're taking four or five herbicides dur during the year to try and control that um, and many of these herbicides were actually um, banned I'm not saying that uh, is this coming through all right I just got a sign to say that the reception was a bit fuzzy yeah Nicole you just you just paused for a while your your reception dropped out so we'll just keep watching that that's probably just 10 seconds Oh, 10 seconds. Uh, so did you? you there was something like in the herbicide um, summary. I mean, we got the message. But yeah. You got the message, you're right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know if that happens again. Yeah. Okay. Thanks to Hilary. So, so people have asked, we had a few questions being asked and people are asking, what's the difference between vermicast and vermicompost? Um, so vermicast is the very end byproduct of organic matter breakdown after it's been through the worm. So basically worm poop. Vermicompost may be um, a more rapid process. Um, uh, you can produce vermicompost in just a few weeks, but you may still be able to tell what the initial um, material was. Um, so there are methods where we can um, maybe get worms to work through compost. Um, but yeah, basically vermicompost is not quite totally finished breaking down. Um, and, and that can have pros and cons. So vermi extract versus leachates. So um, I don't like leachates and, and, <laughs> and I'm gonna clarify what I mean by that. So a vermi extract, um, uh, slightly different to a vermi wash. So I believe Nutrisoil are doing a vermi wash whereby um, water is actually passing through their beds and then they have um, quite an awesome system that uh, takes that water uh, after it's been filtered and then and stores it. So a vermi extract, we're actually taking um, the vermicast and we're putting that through perhaps an extractor, so something like this. So um, this is a bag of um, vermicast with water being pumped through it and, and just um, being agitated. So going through a pump and just the water's being passed through that. So you see that lovely dark color. And vermicast, if that's what you're buying and um, and you put it through a system like this, you should find very little left in a sack by the end of this process. So vermicast, if it's been through a worm, is, is very, very soluble. Um, so yeah, most of that material will be breaking down. That's the wonderful Grant Sims down at um, Victoria No-Till. Um, yeah, he's doing some cool stuff. All right, so I see an extract as being very different from a leachate. So leachate is the stuff that oozes out the bottom of compost or worm bins. Now sure, it might have some nutrients in it. It might have some beneficial plant materials. Uh, we find it's very bacterial dominated. And if you've just fed them like a whole lot of food scraps and some pumpkins or whatever, and you've just got like a little bin and it's all coming out the bottom, it's just vegetable ooze. Like it's just the water that's coming off the vegetables. So the perfect system makes no liquid. So if your worm bin's making a liquid, you're not feeding it enough carbon. And I would just take this leachate and I put it back through the bin because it may contain pathogens. Um, we can see damping down. We can actually see diseases being introduced into your garden if that's what you were using it for. Um, I know people get really excited about it and then they get really upset because I've just like, I don't know, told them that their children are ugly or something, but um, your children are ugly. No, <laughs> so yeah, it's not, um, <laughs> put it back through the bed. If you want to be making a, a worm, extract then take it from the actual finished um, vermicast and, and up your carbon everyone's I find most home worm farms are not feeding enough carbon and we're going to talk about what carbon is anyway so my favorite actually are the compost slurries so um, the slurry means that you're putting the vermicast straight into water and then putting that out so we're not extracting it off we're sending all of that vermicast out so you use slightly more um, then maybe you would use if it was an extract or a compost tea, but I prefer it because you're putting the home out. Um, water source is critical. I'm actually say water source is critical for um, compost um, teas and any time that we're, we're using any kind of water source, check your iron levels, check your hardness, 
make sure you haven't got any chlorine in it. Right, if we found, um, uh, we're working on a place in California and they were not getting any results from using uh, a microbial product that is known to be quite good. And then we had a look and their hardness was like at 600 parts per million or something. I can't remember. It was really high. Um, that's going to shut down um, uptake to the plant and it's going to just close, shut down your microbiology. Um, so the, why I like the compost slurries is everything goes out at once. The slurries can um, take up to a fifth of an inch or um, half a centimeter size material. So we can include seed that gets sprayed out. We can put minerals out there. Um, the slurry sprayer that I really like from Chaos Springs will take up to 40% solid material. So um, yeah, we can put a lot of mineral out. And what we find is it's actually the quorum signals are more important than the living component, which means that we can spray at any time of the year. So often when people talk about compost teas or best time to apply, you're like, we need to do it early spring, late fall, late autumn. <coughs> Sorry, I'm bilingual. Um, <coughs> but uh, what we find with these compost slurries is we're putting them out all year round and we're still seeing a, a plant response to it. Um, there's no wait time, there's no brewing. Yay. Uh, you do use a lot more water, of course, so that could be an issue for some of you that are in um, water restricted areas. So this is an example. This is actually where I'm parked up right now um, at the Too Lazy Too Ranch, which is Steve Charter, who I do mention in the book. And this is um, his army truck that he goes out and applies the compost um, slurries. So he's got a single nozzle that's you can't quite see it sitting on the back of that um, truck. And it's that, that nozzle size that I talked about. And he's treating between 1,500 to 2,500 acres a year with, um, with Vermicast to just switch things on. And what he's seeing is a huge diversity of native um, seeds, native plants germinating. And what was really interesting is when he started doing this, um, sorry, allergies from all the dust. <laughs> um, when he started doing this is that, um, uh, dung beetles came back and dung beetles come back in, in mass. So mm -hmm. over 700 dung beetles per cow pat is what we've been counting on this property. Um, and it all, all started to happen uh, when these applications started to go out. So that was kind of neat to, to see happen. Um, and visually, I know these, um, it's hard to tell from these images, but he had pretty much total domination from a um, grass called crested wheat, which was really encouraged by the USDA to be planted. Um, and you see it, it grows kind of in these clumps. It doesn't like competition. Um, it's not great forage uh, later in the season. And what's happened is it's shifted to more palatable grass species. Um, and that, that bare soil is really closed in. So it's been, um, it's been phenomenal. And yeah, that happened over about a three to four year period. Yeah, depending. So a big part of what we're talking about is, um, and we're talking about regenerating soils or building soil, is the development of the rhizosheath, or what I like to call the Rastafarian rootsman. Can you have these root systems that look like great big dreadlocks? And the importance of that is, this is really what's protecting plants. This is what's enabling nutrient uptake and plant growth. It's the conduit of what's feeding your microbes, it's building carbon and it's building resilience. So we'll see a buffer of temperatures, massive difference in temperatures, like as much as 30 degrees difference across fence lines where we have a rhizosheath like this compared to plants that are growing without it. pH differences. If you have a soil that might be a pH of 4.5, the plant through this rhizosheath can buffer it by as much as two units. So instead of 4.5, it's experiencing 6.5. You might have a pH of nine, but what the riser sheet does is that plant's experiencing seven. So start digging holes and have a look. Do you have a riser sheet that looks like that, All right? And when this guy first started, his root systems was really only that top inch, and now he's got this massively developed root system, All right? Just through supporting that plant, optimizing plant bricks and getting this pump working, All right? Do you have riser sheets that look like that? So for those of you in um, Western Australia, you guys have some pretty major issues with aluminium or aluminium. Um, this riser sheath will defend that plant against aluminium. So get interested in this because right now there's huge amounts of aluminium coming through into plants and then that has a consequence for animal health and human health. 
So one of the things we want to focus on is how do we get that rhizosheath developed from the get-go? And that really starts with the seed microbiome. So there's two ways that the microbiome develops inside the seed. So either from its mother plant or horizontal, which, which comes from the air or from the soil, right? And this is one of these new frontiers that, again, that people are just starting to kind of cue into and go, oh, you mean, you mean seeds are alive? Really? Yes. All right, so that microbiology is coming from up from the soil or through that rhizosheath or actually just in the atmosphere. So there's things like lactobacillus that are just in the air, all right? So how a seed is grown and what that kind of microbial community is, is going to impact too on that, that seed, that next generation, what it's going out into the world in. So if we can uh, have a healthy seed microbiome, it's going to prime and speed up germination. It helps that plant to induce defense, solubilizes nutrients, helps that plant to fix nitrogen. It's producing plant hormones in this process. And if you've come, if those seeds actually come from, uh, from places that really aren't looking after microbiology and not thinking about soil health, that seed microbiome can actually contain pathogens. So you're bringing pathogens into your property. So there's been quite a few really awesome videos that we're seeing out in the internet space about rhizophagy. So 30 to 100% of seedling nutrients comes from the absorption of bacteria at the root tip. So rhizophagy means those roots are actually feeding and stimulating bacteria. So all that blue dust around that root tip, that's, that's your bacteria. They stimulate it, then they absorb that bacteria, then they basically blow the membrane on that outside of the bacteria and they absorb the nutrients. Nasty little plants, all right? But if that plant has microbiology in it and that seed from the get-go, it's got that microbiology that's coming out and helping it to absorb nutrients, all right? So what we want to see is, do we have hairy, dirty roots, which I know you Australians just think is hilarious, but um, it is initiated by having bacteria inside the actual cells of the plant, so like the endophytes. And so if we, um, so basically imagine that as that root is starting to develop, it's like it's irritated by the bacteria and it sends off root hairs. So the, the more hairs that you have, the more disease protection the more the nutrient and the water uptake. So if you look at that wild type um, image there and you can see like that massive amount of root hairs all being stimulated by bacteria. But what we're finding is we're reducing this plant's ability through breeding, through having a reduction in that bacteria diversity and the amount of microbiology that's in the system, which means we now have less disease protection less nutrient and less water uptake. So again, go and dig up your plants and have a look. Are they hairy, dirty roots or are they clean like that? Does soil stick to them or can you actually see these little naked roots, right? And, and what I'm finding is most properties, unless you're really looking after your system, have these naked, very sad little roots. Um, so when we're doing our seed dressings, if, if there's one thing, like I'm not a big one for like, oh, you should never and don't do this and this is bad, but never, ever, 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 never use neonicotinoids, all right? If there's one thing that we could all stop today, globally, stop using those things. Um, the USDA actually put out, um, well, that was an internal email that showed that for every one benefit from a neonicotinoid, there was a hundred costs. Now, there's not many things that <laughs> exist out there on the planet that have a one to hundred um, benefit to cost, all right? It's not good, all right? Those neonicotinoids change 600 genes in the plant so that the plant um, becomes more vulnerable to diseases. They change things like cell wall structure and the ability for them to, pro to produce defense hormones, all right? Those neonicotinoids, not only are they killing bees um, and any other kind of insects, they're also uh, causing deformities in uh, white-tailed deer here in um, Dakotas. They've been measuring uh, these disruptions in wildlife. So they are affecting mammals. Stop using them. Uh, so yeah, if that scares you, then you could coat your seeds with compost or the vermicast extracts. We can also drip biologicals down beside the seed if, you've got a, if you are in a cropping operation. We're also putting dried vermicast down the drill. So we're putting 30 kilos per hectare, 30 pounds an acre, um, we didn't have anyone tell us what kind of rate, so we've just been trialing and that seems to be a pretty good sweet spot. And what we're seeing is um, really good germination, 
but also really good um, competition in existing sward. So we are drilling straight into plants that are known to be quite competitive, and yet we're seeing some really good germination. So these kinds of seed dressings are gonna encourage root development and that riser sheath right from the get-go. Okay? So Korean Natural Farming's been doing this for a very long time. So you could use uh, five kilos of um, a good mature biodiverse compost, so Johnson Sioux compost or vermicast, mixed with a bit of molasses and a cup of milk, make a slurry. So you wanna take enough seed just to coat it um, and then you're going to mix that small amount of seed into a larger amount of seeds. Um, so yeah, this is the Johnson Sioux recipe. So he's using half a litre of that compost slurry off that Johnson Sioux. So there's the Johnson Sioux. And if you haven't seen that, you haven't made it, um, you could go and watch some of the YouTube videos. So he's taking that 10 kilos of seed and then adding it to another 120 kilos of seed and mixing it. If you don't, you find it kind of balls up, right? And then you need to plant you need to dry it okay, and spread it on a tarp and rake it to, but before you drill. So I actually prefer just to apply directly to the seed before drilling. So just using one to five liters of a worm extract or compost extract per, per ton of seed um, and just getting a good coating. You can just spray it on, mist it on, or some people have augers and they're just augering it straight onto the seed just so you're getting that um, elixir of life onto the seed directly. For solid applications, um, there's been some great research done in viticulture and on pastures showing that 750 kilos or 750 pounds an acre or 750 kilos a hectare um, gave a four to seven year benefit after application. Um, they definitely found it was better if it was covered or incorporated. Um, and yeah, ideally they just didn't want it killed by the UV, but certainly we're seeing some very long responses from it if you've got good management. Now, you're, you're gonna come in and then herbicide, fungicide, pesticide, and overgraze it, um, you're probably not gonna see great results from it. But yeah, we are seeing long-term res responses. If you're spraying this stuff, um, then you need to keep your spray pressure below 80 PSI, which you know for a lot of gear, that's not really a big deal. Uh, you want your filters larger than 400 microns. And the reason for that is your nematodes and your protozoa can be up to that size. So we want to make sure we're not catching them. Uh, the open trash pumps, so a diaphragm pumps that don't have any compression, that's ideal. And then test your brew before and after to make sure microbes are not being killed. So if you've got a little microscope, even if you don't really know what you're doing, just have a look and go, okay, I can see there's a fungi and a nematode and okay, it looks good. Um, and I think actually it was the day we were spraying this spray is I tested one brew, looked great. And then the next brew came in and everything's twitching like this. These nematodes are like, Ugh. and it's like, what happened? And then we, we have freshwater rain tanks and the rainwater had run out and we'd, um, um, my ex had switched to, uh, just town supply and it was full of chlorine. So we picked up that we were just about to kill our whole brew. So that was a, it was a good idea to actually test things before and after. So some people go, well, why would I do vermicast over compost? So vermicast can actually be made faster than compost. However, you will be making a, a more bacterial product if you do that. The slower it is and the more fungal development that we get, but it can be quicker. Um, it can require slightly more labor in terms of feeding. Um, and that's if you're going to ongoingly feed it. I've just found as I've got older and lazier, um, I'm finding I'm not necessarily spending a lot of time on worm farms um, and actually can still produce a really good product. You don't need to turn it because the worms are doing that. You may re It does require a lot more space. And this is when you talk to the municipal waste people about we should do vermicast. They're like, you can't do it because you need long windrows, you're gonna take up a lot more space and they're trying to build these women six meter high, um, spontaneously combusting nastiness. Don't buy it, by the way, don't buy that stuff. All right, um, compost, uh, the vermicast can be more vulnerable to environmental fluctuations. So extreme heat and cold, um, wet, you can get away with a little bit more with compost than I think you can with personally with vermicast. And I know Rochelle's probably gonna afterwards go, no, no, it's fine, <laughs> but they've got a pretty nifty system. Um, you might have to spend a bit more in terms of buying worms at the start, but for me, once you've brought worms, you should never have to buy them again unless you kill them, which mm, is possible. But yeah, you shouldn't have to keep buying them. 
So the worms that we're commonly using, there are the tiger worms. So these stripy ones. Um, used to say that when I used to teach this to schools, it's like that they haven't got any teeth, even though they're called tigers, right? They're just stripy. Uh, the red worms or the dung worms, you'll often find these in manure. They've got a very flattened end on their tail. And then the Indian blue, which I really like, they kind of move like snakes and they're super shiny and iridescent. Um, but the tiger worms really are where it's at. They, are, they, they reproduce the fastest. They, yeah, they're just machines. So I think most of what you'll find will be the tiger worms if you're shopping around. So thinking about livestock, because you got livestock, you got dead stock. So we've got to think about what is it that they need to live. So what if you're going to set up a worm farm, what's going to be required? So you're going to need some kind of bedding material, um, some source of ongoing food to make sure you've got good air movement through those beds. Is it close to somewhere um, where you can have water? And can you manage that temperature um, a little bit? Yeah. So those are things to think about. So when you start, you can start with 500 grams to two and a half kilos of worms per meter squared of like surface area. Um, you can get away with 500 grams. They breed up very, very fast. Um, so I'm talking about a prepared base. We'll get into that. Food, cover, and then access to water. Very good. So bedding materials. So you want some kind of material that is very stable. It doesn't create any heat. It has low nitrogen and high carbon, good water absorbency and good airflow. So some of you might have um, issues around local council or land use requirements so that you know, you're not allowed to create any leachate at the bottom, which you won't be because you're gonna have good carbon. Um, but yeah, I mean, everywhere I drive around, I'm like, oh, worm food, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that's been wasted. It's super easy to get these kind of materials. So old straw, old bedding materials, um, the stuff in the background there of that picture is white wood chips, which I'm a big fan of, um, newspaper, cardboard, anything like that, nice and light and fluffy, that's going to just make sure that it doesn't pack down and get really easy and gross. So when you start making the beds, you can just make them directly onto the ground if you want to. Um, this one here, we put uh, weed matting down um, because of the trees. Um, the trees got into it anyway. We actually ended up moving this worm bed. It was quite wet underneath too. So there's stones underneath that. Um, so it was more, we put that matting down because we were trying to overcome environmental restrictions. But anyway, so we lay down you can put four to eight inches. See, I've turned into an American. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what that is anymore. 10 centimeters to 20 centimeters of um, light fluffy stuff, right? So hay, straw, anything that's not gonna get hot. Now we can start feeding them and they can, we can feed them like pure cow manure and they will be very fine on that, but you're not gonna make the best product really. What we want to be thinking about is the more diversity possible. So dairy farmers that I work with are just feeding effluent, like just feeding manure, and that's fine. You've got a waste product, brilliant. It's going to be very, very bacterial, and it's not going to have a huge diversity in terms of nutrients. Um, so if I'm going to feed effluent, we're going to feed in strips on the top of that windrow, and really no deeper than 20 centimeters. Um, sometimes it's a bit tricky when you're just dumping stuff out of the buckets. Um, yeah, so you might want to fork it just to... Now, if you are getting this from, say, a dairy farm or a piggery, so I used to, my main food source was a pig manure. Um, just ask them about what's happening with wormers. <laughs> um, and the, you can test it. So let, as long as it's not super fresh, um, put a little bit of compost in the bottom of an ice cream container and then put in some of that manure and then put some worms in it and come back the next day. And if they're all lying, belly up, uh, don't use that, um, basically. <laughs> so they've probably got something in it. So your carbon to nitrogen ratio is vital, just the same as it is with compost. Um, but we're going to err on the side of more carbon materials because we want to be making these high fungal products, right? So your brown materials are your carbon materials. So leaves, straw, brown leaves, bark, paper, cardboard. Uh, your nitrogen, so that's the green stuff that really heats up your compost. Your wet materials, so manure, um, green grass, silage, vegetable, fruit scraps. Um, we were taking paunch from um, uh, slaughterhouses, but the paunch has plastic boluses in it in, in New Zealand for um, 
carrying um, minerals and stuff in it. So we stopped doing that. That's not a good idea. There's a whole lot of contamination. But some of the big um, worm farms in New Zealand, they're just using paunch and paper pulp. And that's, that's their entire recipe. And it makes a very quick to break down product. Again, very bacterial. All right, so your nitrogen carbon ratios, you can just look that stuff up online if you're not sure, like what kind of ratio we're going for. But the higher that carbon to nitrogen ratio, then the slower it is to break down. Um, so bark could be like, could be 600 actually, like it could be some like hardwood that's very slow to break down compared to say willow, which has um, a much narrower um, carbon to nitrogen ratio. So we'll break down really fast and then think, you know, how fast grass clippings break down. There's some examples. Um, spent mushroom um, material is fabulous, unless it's not. So some of the best material I've ever seen is from um, mushroom farms and it's just beautiful and it's full of nematodes and protozoa. And then some of the stuff we've got from mushroom farms is the worst because they've used methyl bromide to kill everything. So if you're gonna take spent mushroom material, then ask them um, how did they how do they neutralize or, or do they just steam it or, or is it just still full of the mushrooms? That would be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have got old compost, then we're gonna use that as some of our bedding material as well and just really bulk it up and be able to produce more material. Um, sea lettuce, some of you might live near the coast and you'll find that like there's all the stuff getting swept up off the coast. That'd be brilliant to put into a worm farm. Manures. And then other types of stimulants. Worms go absolutely bananas for bokashi. So those of you that are using bokashi, it is another Korean composting form. Um, I love it. It's like a pickling. Um, we can put our food scraps into it in the kitchen. You can leave them in there for a few weeks. They won't smell. And they put it out into the worm farm and the worms go gaga. Um, it's the fattest, healthiest worms I've ever seen in my life has been on bokashi. EM stands for effective microorganisms. Um, which is what you can make bakashi out of. Adding forest leaf litter, so thinking about what some of the native organisms might be to incorporate, things like blood and bone. Um, we do use guano. A little bit of molasses sometimes just to get them excited. Um, and bran and oats can be used to really fatten worms if you are looking to be selling worms. And then a bit of fish hydrolysate if you want to, just to kind of get your fungal numbers up. So as a general recipe, um, brown materials, 30% for bacterial compost or less, and you want above 40% for your fungal composts, right? And I just, I just weigh it out in a bucket. So go, okay, for every two loads, I'm going to do three loads of this or whatever. Um, we're going to also add, think about where is this material going to be used? Do I have, so if you think about Western Australia, you guys have like your paramagnetism is like flatlined. It's like your heartbeat is flatlined in terms of energy. And New Zealand has a lot of paramagnetic rock materials because they come from um, active, or you know, more recently active volcanic materials. So you go, well, actually, maybe I'll put some paramagnetic rock dust in there. Or I know that my soil is very low in phosphate. Put a little bit of phosphate in there and it will stimulate your phosphate solubilizing bacteria. Or your soil is very low in calcium. I'm going to put some lime in there. I actually want you to put lime in anyway because it helps the worm's digestive system. They have a calciferous gland. They really appreciate some calcium just to help grind stuff up. Um, and it also helps to keep that flocculated and opened up. So this is images of the compost, uh, the vermicast that I used to make. You see there's a lot of visible wood chip on that. So if I was um, selling it in bulk, I'd sell it with all the wood chips in it. Um, otherwise, I'd dry it and then put it through a screen to harvest it. But you see, I'm pushing for a lot of fungal biomass. So to look at it from the top, it actually just looked like a wood pile. And then you dig in there and it was full of worms, right? And so the more carbon, if you can get white wood chips, so that's like poplar, willow, elm, birch, beech, cottonwood, those types of species, like soft, white, deciduous, um, not pine, not gums. They're fine if you're going to use pine and gum, you just got to age them, maybe spray them with some fish just to help break down those tannins and volatile organic compounds. So if you smell that gum material, uh, it shouldn't smell like a gum forest anymore when you put it in, like it should have lost those smells, ideally. 
Um, then there's some other stuff that we could do. So you can add like a finished comp, like some finished compost to re-inoculate the new one is a good idea. Um, yeah, you could put a little bit of blood. I don't know. Maybe not. That sounds gross. But people do. Um, <laughs> bone meal, clay. So there is an argument of adding like 5% clay to um, increase the colloidal nature. So increase your cation exchange capacity. Um, I've done some work on it. I don't really see the difference. I know some people swear by it, but um, whatever. It'll help bulk up your end product if you wanted to add some clay, some seaweed, molasses, same sort of things as the last one. Um, air movement. Now, if you've got good carbon levels, then you're not going to be needing to add in, um, you're not going to have to aerate it, all right? The worms should be doing that. If you have been overdoing the nitrogen or you've been overwatering, then you might find that it'll start to um, smell. That would be bad. So if it starts to get anaerobic, then you might need to open it up, uh, aerate it, add more carbon, so paper, cardboard. If you're putting paper and cardboard in, make sure it's moistened before you do. Um, that's my dad there. And I used to aerate with a, well, I call them worm forks, but they're steel horse manure picker upper is. Um, so you can buy them with the steel prongs and then I just move that through the worm bed just to aerate it if it needed to be. Moisture. Now it should be around 70% and the way to tell is grab a handful of it and squeeze it between your hands and you should get one or two drips, right? And the material should sort of keep a clumped shape um, and it shouldn't keep dripping obviously afterwards. So if it's too wet, you're gonna, it's gonna start to smell, might get compacted. Um, might get anaerobic. And if it's too dry, this is going to be the number one thing that's going to kill worms, right? They're just going to stop. You know, a lot of schools that I was dealing with, they stopped doing the worm farms because they'd kill them during the summer holidays when they'd all go away. Um, it wasn't because of a lack of food, it was because they dried up and died. So the thing that we were doing with the schools is like cut a pumpkin in half just before you go on holiday and just drop that pumpkin on top of that and it will slowly leak out all its juices and keep them moist and the worms love pumpkins. Um, it's like one of those slow feeding things for like uh, an aquarium or something. Um, so yeah, if it's too wet, then adding in your bulking agents. Um, I just got this photo this morning. This is a worm farm that was started last year up in Alberta, um, top of Alberta. All right, and so yeah, add some coarse sawdust, shredded cardboard, whatever. Um, if it is too dry, you can add, like just feed like feed as a slurry. So actually water the food before you add it in. Um, so vermicast can end up being only 10 to 50% of the initial volume. That's not right. Uh, I'd say 30%, 30 to 50%, depending on what it is. So add more carbon just to bulk it up and add, you could add some more poultry manure, things like that. The different materials are gonna break down to different volumes. It depends if you're trying to you know, create more volume. Temperature, also very important. So if between that 20 to 25 degrees is what we call the worms are on the boil. So this is where they, they're reproducing, they're feeding a lot, um, but they have a very wide range that they can survive in. So certainly, and if your bed is big enough, then they can retreat to different parts where it might be cooler or wetter or whatever. So the, the larger that bed, then um, the more variability. So worms will be able to survive. So in, um, hot, dry summer. So places like Western Australia, I'm going to put a cover on them. Um, you see the cover in the previous or wherever it was. See those covers? That cover there is a compost text cover. It's um, a geotex fiber that breathes, um, but it'll shed excess water if you get heavy rain, um, but it doesn't dry out underneath it. So I really like them. So if you've got high wind, good idea to keep it covered. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but those white speckles, that's ice. These worms still were working through and very happy working in um, a worm farm that went down to minus 30 degrees. I'm trying to think if it was, it was Fahrenheit. It was really freaking cold, all right? So, um, and those worms were just fine. So it's always amazed me that you can still see worms working and functional even if it is quite cold. Um, who would have thought? So yeah, as long as they've got somewhere to retreat, but these worms are moving through that, those icicles just fine. And so in this video, this is putting the worm beds down for winter. Um, so that is 
uh, the bedding material on the bottom, a big feed of manure, and then a foot of straw, and then covering it, and then that material gets covered, and coming the following spring, most of that material's already been worked through, and probably by autumn, fall, it's ready to be harvested. So this is what I was saying, like I've got really lazy, is these beds are not being fed ongoingly. They're just a whole lot of material. And as long as you've got enough carbon in there and they don't go anaerobic and you're keeping the water up, worms will work through all of this. So in terms of like waste minimization for most um, ranches and farms, you know, if you've got a whole lot of, if you've got yards or you're feedlotting or whatever, and you've got all this manure and straw, there's no reason why you can't just build up a pile like this. Make sure you've got some moisture and, and let them go. Go for it. Okay, so these worm beds can be super simple. I don't know if um, the Austins are on this call. I thought they might be. This The photo on the right is New South Wales. Um, they just started that bed. So um, straw and manure, same with the one on the left. This is Montana. Um, they don't have to be complex, right? But at the same time, you know, just, just building them up on the ground, um, feeding whatever organic waste materials you've got, um, or you can be really complex. So this is the TAT-G. The TAT-G um, uh, is designed to process a lot of waste. Like it can do 200 kilos or 500 pounds of organic waste a day, a day, all right? And what it's making is a vermicompost. So um, great for effluent or if you've got like a, I don't know, a horse barn or something, you can just be chucking this material in uh, and they're designed to operate in the, in the heat or the cold. So. But, you know, I just think we over-engineer things. I personally just like stuff on the ground. One on the left, these are these through-flow systems. One of the problems we had with the ones on the left is um, rats. And people don't like rats. Uh, whereas the beds on the ground, all you need is a good Jack Russell and your problem's taken care of. <laughs> um, and, yeah, round bales. So wrapped round bales, if you can find... Um, an old bale that's gone all mushy, cut a hole in the top, chuck a cow pat and a handful of worms and leave it. And a year later you can come back and that whole bale would have turned into vermicast. It will be very bacterial vermicast, but it's vermicast no less. So um, as far as being lazy, I'm, I'm all about that. That one on the left, that's one of my worm bins um, that I was growing worms in. So they, if you're selling worms, you better to not take them out of the beds that are making the vermicast. So I would take um, these beds would, these bins are just full of eggs and then I feed them and fatten them up with things like oats and bran and whatever. Um, but they're better than a bathtub. Those, I know people make bathtubs, but once you've filled that bathtub, it's super heavy and like, how do you get stuff out? So tricky. Um, so then, yeah, how do you separate it? So one way you can do this, put fresh food at one end. Um, you can get the mechanical sieve. So I used to have a trommel screen. It seemed like inhumane trauma to worms quite personally. Um, you can mildly heat them, don't cook them, but just warm them up and the worms will move out. Um, or you could dry the vermicast and the worms will go to moisture. My favorite way is actually light extraction. So using, so that's the trommel at the top. I don't like them. I, I think they, they, tra they do traumatize the worms. Um, but yeah, the one that we developed and I haven't got a picture of it, but it was corrugated piece of plastic um, weed, a uh, wind cloth stretched over a frame and then you put the vermicast on top and just mush it about with your hands and all the worms move through. And I was harvesting probably two and a half, three kilos a minute. All right, you can harvest huge volumes of worms and they're not stressed out. If anyone's interested in that, um, I can't help you because I haven't written it down. But <laughs> anyway, I need to draw a picture of it, but it, it, it's a lot easier and a lot faster. Okay, so the keys to success. So I'm pretty much spot on time, Rochelle, so don't panic there. Um, <laughs> is avoid overfeeding, all right? So if you're gonna um, like be putting on little vegetable scraps and stuff, and um, that's you're gonna hit hurdles if you do that. Make sure you're not too hot, too cold. Keep that moisture just right. Make sure it's not making any smells. Give them a bit of lime. Um, okay, and then I got some stuff about testing it, but I'll leave this because I, I I can come back to it if you ask the questions. But at the end of the day, you know, if you are using um, vermicast or doing any of these regenerative practices, then just make sure you're measuring your results. And I'm using that picture because I'm pretty sure that's my son in that picture. He was helping me monitor. Um, you know, so what is happening with pasture cover or um, tree health? What's happening with bricks? 
do your tissue testing, visual soil assessments, soil temperature and infiltration, right? So make sure that you are monitoring things. Are we seeing changes above and below ground um, to, you know, to really give you confidence? And, you know, I've got some pretty big operations that I work with and they're like, oh, we can't do this. And it's like, well, what if you did one tenth of the farm? Just do that right and then just start and then the next year do that and and just keep moving it around until you can cover more and more ground um but yeah the really the take home is you know just just get started and i'll stop sharing and we'll just have a conversation that i've yelled at you for an hour <laughs> thank you so much um I actually think there's so much information in there that um, people's minds will be blown. That's literally being a comment. So the awesome thing Sorry. about this, no, no, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> like if that was our only chance, yes, we, we only pick up a you know, small amount, but um, this has been recorded and people can watch this over and over and over again. And the fun thing about recordings is you can move to the bit that you picked, you know, you wanted to see. So, um, that was a very generous, very generous presentation. So thank you so much. Um, there's lots more to cover in the questions, but um, there was just so much information and research based and ideas. And I know that people are really hungry for that, um, you know, some for the research and some for the, you know, actual, um, you know, follow up, um, you know, models and, and things that you're, you're suggesting. So don't panic everyone. There's time. <laughs> we have our lives in front of us to absorb and understand this, but um, it's very, very exciting, very exciting information. So um, I thought I'd uh, pay homage to the people that uh, got their questions in early. Um, and so just a, a quick few questions that came before um, the, the day. Um, the, the, and I know that you will have covered things, so it'll just be a, a quick summary to say, yep, okay. Um, we did cover that, but they might not have picked up. So in, in your book, you talk about, in, and you did talk about the vermicast being fungal dominant. Um, you know, people are really interested in um, recipes or, um, you know, you spoke about the white wood and things, but just how to, you know, be more fungal. Um, yeah. yeah, I kind of feel like I answered that. Yeah, yep. So your white, your woods and your white, um, your white woods, woods and things like that. And yeah, fish, totally fish and carbon-based, yeah, fish and carbon-based materials really pushing it. Car a paper by itself doesn't push the fungal load enough. Um, so people might just use paper in their bins, but yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, other questions we had that, you know, we're happy to, you know, answer, as I said, we're here Monday to Friday, nine to five Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, quick questions around um, timing of application of putting worm liquids out. I think it's not so complex. And I think we're so used to um, being told, you know, really particular things about applying chemicals and, um, and, and other sort of, um, you know, even chemical um, synthetic inputs and things like that. But, you know, applying, you know, worm liquid, you know, at the, you know, um, amp, like when the ambient temperature is not, you know, completely freezing or completely <laughs> boiling, like, you know, you, you can't go too wrong, I would say. So the where people sort of know how to put it on their, when they're crops, because that's during the growing season for the pastures, you're just looking for those, um, um, you know, like your autumn and spring almost, but your growing times um, that you're going to see the most benefits. So I'm sort of just skipping through those questions. There's a few questions around that. So um, I hope that's enough information. Um, uh, promoting worm populations in our soil at commercial farm level. Um, do you feel you've probably covered that as well? Just keeping ground cover. <laughs> it's a big one. Do you want to make any more comment about a question that's to do with Oh, so it's someone trialing a brown manure crop and subsequent pasture cropping phase for the first time after years of conventional cropping. He wants to know um, how I could introduce or promote worm populations in the soil at commercial farm. Uh, yeah, well, that's kind of the benefit of the vermicast is that it stimulates mm -hmm. earthworms. Like it's quite interesting in that it doesn't come from earthworms, but earthworms go through the roof. Um, 
yeah, so it's one of the things to be digging holes and, and, and measure it. Yeah. Um, the actual research that you're referring to, some people asking for the research on the worm casts and juices, um, and whether there's a lot of references in your book, isn't there? The research yeah. benefits. So, um, yeah. Buy the book. <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and people have asked, is all of this information in the book? Well, it's not all of, you know, this is, it, no. you've brought a lot of information into it. So, um, uh, another question, ideal soil conditions for applying compost, slurry vermicast. Similar again, growing times is the best time to put that out, would you say? Yeah. All right, well, I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, I just skipped through those and now we'll just go to our, you've got those questions there. Toxicology in worms, can you reference studies looking at gut impact in worms? Population decline and or adapt adaptability? Not quite sure. Oh, oh, okay. Not quite sure what the question means, but there has been um, work using uh, worms for mine rehabilitation. So they will actually, um, they, they can, um, uh, yeah, they can process heavy metals um, and take them out of the, yeah, the, what do they call it? Some kind of remediation anyway that, that they use, they're using worms for. Um, but yeah, we certainly are seeing a decline across the planet um, of worms in horticulture and agriculture because of uh, chemicals and disturbance. In part, what we're seeing is, I mean, they're pretty tough, is that they're they haven't got the food. So what they're feeding on is, you know, massive bacterial and fungal populations. So if we're taking out the, the, the bottom of the pyramid, which is also algae, you think algae's the bottom and that's what herbicides take out. So if we're taking out the bottom of that food pyramid, it's gonna impact on the one that's at the top, which is the earthworms. So um, they're pretty tough and they need food. Yeah. Um, the next question was asking about nematodes and that's really interesting, Daniel, you say you've only heard them in a negative way. And it's quite interesting because 95% of nematodes are beneficial, uh, but 95% of the research has gone into the 5% that are bad. Um, so when you're farming potatoes, you're, you're trying to avoid yeah, the, the root feeding nematodes, but um, the beneficial nematodes are the ones that are going to keep those bad ones away. So the use of nematicides actually creates more conditions for the bad nematodes. So um, we can be in this catch-22 situation. So very much we want to um, get um, yeah, your beneficial nematodes in the system. And they've shown this, um, I saw some, I can't remember where I saw it, but this really cool a video and you basically watch the beneficial nematodes were like kung fuing the root feeding because they you know, they don't want the root damaged um which is kind of cool yeah so how long does frost protection last after a foliar application of worm juice in cereals uh, and greens uh the research showed about two months yep yeah that's awesome Mark. i didn't think you'd have an answer to that <laughs> that's awesome you know me it's yeah nice. everything <laughs> So I'm just going to go through the So we add ammonium sulfate to reduce hardness of water when using, or can we use, can we add ammonium sulfate to reduce hardness yeah. of water when using compost lorries? Yeah, yeah. And people are using like um, five to eight kilos per hundred, per thousand, no, per, per 400 litres of water. Um, with yeah, ammonium sulfate to do that. Um, yeah, and I, I don't mind ammonium sulfate as an input. Biology seem to like it. Yep. Can humates help with hard water or do we need to use reverse osmosis? Would magnetic water conditioners help? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, I, um, humates can help. Yeah, just depends if people want black water. Now the questions are growing by the minute. Do you recommend using compost tea soup soil food web compost style and worm cast together or will worm cast be sufficient? What kind of rate additionally applying seaweed, fish, burp as well? Can these all be mixed together or spread via slurry separately? Um, but you could spread it all together. I don't recommend compost teas anymore. I used to do them commercially and I just see people having some Unless you're really good on a microscope, I'm just not a big fan of a compost tea. And unless you've got really, really good water, most of what you're brewing a lot of the time is just bacteria um, or just a more shallow 
group of organisms. So yeah, Chuck's, you, you could put some vermicast in there. But yeah, I just found slurries have really got us around a lot of the complications and issues. Um, yep, yeah, Ross asked, hard to get water at less than 150 parts per million on most farms using bore water. What should we use? Maybe rainwater from the tank? So that's what those questions were before. And um, okay. yeah, um, okay. rainwater would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, starting out with limited resources, would you recommend foliar spray on a mixed species cover crop or spreading vermicast first? Does the vermicast get spread on the surface of the soil or need to be turned in? If you're putting it on the surface, you're going to use a lot more. I remember I said like the 700 mm. kilos. So um, I would prefer to put it with the seed or put it as a liquid on the seed. I would do it together. You want to set that. And like if we're doing just solid vermicast at 30 kilos, that's not it's not a lot of material and it's not very expensive. Um, or if you're just putting one to five liters and uh, correct me, Rochelle, what you recommend, but put that on the seed, you're better to do that and have it all go at once and, and, and do that as economically as possible. Even if you have to make your own worm extract to do it, um, you're better to, to go at once. Yeah. Yeah. And jump into Nicola if you want to as well. Yeah, so five litres per ton is what we look at for um, inoculating seed. Yeah, but yep. and, and car. No, that was it, inoculating. Yeah, it wasn't casting, it's all right. Uh, did yep. the Johnson Sue slurry, but added too much molasses in one batch, can you impact germination? Yeah, right. yeah, and I've seen people grow a whole lot of diseases from doing that. Mm. Um, uh, do you advocate mycorrhizal inoculation along with the other biological inoculate, inoculant of seed? What we've found, and I think actually Nutrisoil have done some good work on this, is the, the vermicast or the worm extracts actually stimulate mycorrhizae, so you don't need to, to, to do that. Save yourself some money. Yeah, so two and a half times, I think we've got results there. Yeah, two and a half times increase, yeah. So here's from Rob. With all that has been talked about, it is better. Is it better to encourage earthworms in the soil, and does that mean you will still get the same result? Um, yeah, that's a really good question, and I think these are kind of catalysts to get you to that point. So I mean, I've, I've got a guy that I go and visit, and he's got between 100 to 200 worms per shovel. Honestly, you don't need to be adding. Yeah. At that point. However, a lot of where we work is uh, large scale broadacre or um, semi arid environments where there's probably not a lot of worms in there at all. Um, and we really are just providing that catalyst. And what's fascinating is how the grasses, it's like the grasses remember that stimulus because there used to be worms in a lot of these environments and now there's not. Um, and and I don't see that this is something that you do forever. You start to get a system really humming. And sorry, Rochelle, I mean, that might... No, yeah. <laughs> this is the you point know. at which we always say we want to do ourselves out of a job. That would be a good you world want to do yourself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's that. It's not, this is not the treadmill to get on. This is a catalyst and a transition. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, um, with the liquid, what you're doing is you're increasing photosynthesis of the plant. So you're increasing the bricks. Um, you do that with grazing as well. So, um, you know, having worms in your soil and increasing photosynthesis will keep moving you along. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Moving to the questions. So, any tips for using human manure? Human manure to feed worms? Uh, yeah, so, uh, don't. <laughs> um, tip. Unless, unless you are, so, unless you're using your own human manure, and you are not on pharmaceutical drugs and you're not taking the human pill, um, then you could, you, you could feed worms human manure and it's the same rules in terms of making sure that you've got enough carbon. Um, I would probably use um, EM with it as well, the effect of microorganisms just to get it broken down. But for those of you that were looking at biosolids, don't use it. The stuff that's coming out in municipal waste is so contaminated. Um, you just don't want that stuff on your land. It's not like the good old days in China where you were, you know, using manure to grow, your own manure to grow crops. Out manure is not good. <laughs> yeah. Just like Yeah. Is there any type of seaweed that's okay to use on the farm? It's a, is there a particular type that's more beneficial and does the salt affect the worms? 
Yeah, I think I think there probably are different varieties that are going to be more beneficial. Like your, um, I don't know, some of the, like you compare sea lettuce, for instance, that's gone in a second to some of the, you know, the larger cell, um, yeah, seaweeds. So I, I don't know what those species would be, but I think there would be a difference, and it's probably worth just you know, going through the literature or looking at what people that grow seaweed are re really using. Um, we feed seaweed to worm farms and really haven't had much problem with salt, but it's probably worth just giving it a rinse anyway. Yeah, oh, we use a, a bull kelp from Tasmania. So it's, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a whole world on different types of seaweed out there though, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, sea and seaweed companies know their stuff. Like, you know, literally talking to a seaweed company direct is probably you're going to find out a fair bit of information or a combination of seaweed companies. Um, all right, so is someone interested in the relationship between fire and soil biology? They've been using fire to encourage native pasture and reduce rye, clover and dandelion pretty successfully. Now wondering if, if after I burn, do I need to add microorganisms? Um, it's an interesting question, Alexandra, and I've just done a couple series on fire, so I recommend you go and watch those um, videos. Um, I think if you are using a burn that's very fast and light and you're seeing good grass come away, then potentially not. I mean, potentially that system could be working, but um, yeah, you need to assess that for yourself. Um, I always think that vermicast is a good uh, fire recovery because of how it deals to um, those hydrophobic conditions. So that's why we still recommend it. But yeah, if it's working, yeah. Um, next question, can I ask, put seedling soil that has been infected by fungus snaps before in the worm bin to bulk it up? Just don't want to throw out the soil if the worms can save it. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. I haven't, I haven't tried. Yeah. Um, and if you look at, like, when they've done some work looking at how well worms work through everything and do they pick up all the diseases, they don't necessarily like you really want to go through a heating process if you have some kind of disease materials. Um, yeah, because worms don't necessarily get every single bit. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use burnt wood or ash for your worms? Sure. Yep. Good. Easy. What about <laughs> coffee grounds as an input or additive? Sounds great. They love it. And then your worm farm will smell delicious. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd like that. Western Australia. <laughs> uh, James wants to know, he's from Southland, New Zealand. I have access to quality vermicast from Cromwell. In a thousand litre tank, what ratio of vermicast would add to this thousand litres? And then what rate per hectare would, should I spread it? Thousand litre water? Question mark. Vermicast. It's going to depend on your equipment and I would look at it more on a hectare basis. So how much you're trying to spread per hectare as a slurry. Talk to your guys that you're getting that vermicast off, but you know, potentially we're just doing like anywhere between two to 20 kilos or two to 20 pounds an acre. Yep. Do you need to cover windrows to keep them dry? Oh, we can answer that. We don't cover our windrows. Um, no. And that's, it's a size thing um, with ours. So the, the backyard, you know, little, um, worm farms at home are much more susceptible to, you know, um, temperature and, and water and need to be covered at times because of the changing weather. But ours are sort of two to three metres wide and, 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 you know, one to two metres high. So you can always, the worms can always move into material that's, um, you know, moist and, and what they need it to be. So, yeah, no, we don't cover ours. But you could need to if it was a really smaller, much smaller system. Yeah. Um, will spraying vermicast in a highly wooded paddock with gums improve the soil enough to encourage grass growth? It depends what the gums are. You guys have some really gnarly gums that are producing allelopathic chemicals that um, are pretty hard to break down, but I think you could try it. Give it a go. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Give it a go. <laughs> um, hi, will it be possible to get a reply of this Webinar, a reply. I think a copy. Yes, we will be sending copies. I'm getting to the point where I don't get to reread them first. Um, earthworms and tideworms don't go together. What happens when I put it in on my garden full of earthworms? It's not that they don't go together. They just mm. do a bit different. Um, 
they want a really nutrient rich environment. So you're going to find those tiger worms in your manure, or if you've got like piles of organic material somewhere in your garden. Um, but yeah, they stimulate the earthworms. So um, I don't worry about it. If you put vermicast out that's got worms and eggs in it, they'll hatch and they'll just go somewhere else. They'll, they'll go and repopulate the neighbors or something. Uh, what's the shelf life of dried vermicast? Um, we wouldn't sell it if it was older than a year old. Yeah. So if using EC to measure success of vermicast, what rate are we looking for? Does this change based on the bacteria fungal ratio? Yeah, that's a good question. And it does change based. So we're talking about electrical conductivity. Um, so we want ideally between 1.5 to 3 millisiemens. Um, find if it's below 1.2, we, we're not going to get much of a plant response. If it's over 7, you could burn the foliage. So it just tells you like how hot something is. So the more bacterial it is, often the higher that conductivity is. Um, so yeah, between 1.5 and 3 is, is pretty ideal on the liquid. Um, so you're going to put that into a liquid to be able to measure it. Um, I haven't got the numbers in my head for the solid. I'm sorry. Um, Beth's just asking any comments on easy dechlorination of water. Is it effective to add some humic acid to achieve that? Yep, so you could add some humic acid and then just leave it out, just leave it open so it'll just off gas. So you could bubble it and that's probably the best thing. So a bit of humic in there and just bubble it and it'll bubble off. All right, I like this one. Can we extract humic acid from vermicompost? Well, you can answer that one. Well, this is a question, that, or this is a comment that Elaine Ingham made, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, I don't know how we, I, I don't know how we'd extract it, but she always said that, that we should be able to. <laughs> I was oh. thinking. <laughs> oh, so we, we used to, I used to extract it and sell it as an organic humic yeah, acid. Right. Um, and all I was doing was adding water to it and agitating the blimini crickets out of it for like two days. So um, I had a, a rolling drum with be like it had beaters in it and it just beat up that vermicast until it all went into solution and it'll separate into its fulvic and humic portions. So humic acid is actually um, sold or defined by a color. So you need those color charts and those color charts are really expensive. But basically um, that deep dark chocolate brown is your humics and then the golden is your fulvic. So um, yeah, I could separate that off the vermicast and I was selling an organic humic and fulvic acid separately. And yeah, it was pretty low tech, just beat the, beat the, living daylights out of it. <laughs> did you want to add something there, Nicola? I was just saying we did have it tested um, in America and um, we had fulvic and humic acid in it. It was quite small, like all like the amounts of everything in vermicast, they're all in small amounts. And the literature all says that vermicast um, and vermiliquid all have that humic and fulvic acid in it. That's a good segue to the next question about measuring quality of vermicast liquid. And that's just one of the many, many things. Oh, actually, I'll let you answer it, Nicola, because you've got a whole presentation on this. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, so, well, I would have thought we could, you could send it to somewhere like Ash Martin's lab, Microbe Labs Australia. Is that the question? How to uh, measure measuring it? the quality of vermicast liquid. So yeah, that you can you can just send it to you know a chemistry lab or, or send it to yeah a biology lab like um, microbe labs um, and you know but we've always sought to I suppose look deeper <laughs> and find out more information. So it depends you know there's no limit to the amount of money and time you can spend um, if trying to understand vermicast liquid. So um, yeah, the basic chemistry isn't that impressive. Um, and even the basic biology, it's just about everything being in balance. Um, but, but yeah, so um, I think what Nicole is saying that microbe labs would be um, definitely, because they're, they're also doing a, a, um, a lot of testing on different um, vermicasts. So they're starting to get baseline data, if you like. And so they'll be able to give you some feedback. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's me to ask another question. What is the difference between using vermicast and biodynamic preparations? Ooh, fancy. Um, we know people that use them together. Yeah, you can use them together. I mean, 
you're talking about something that's the principles are very different. Um, Rudolf Steiner, who came up with biodynamics, one of his good friends was actually a microbiologist, and there was some discussion that maybe you know the the cow horn, so biodynamic prep five hundred, which is cow horn stuff with manure, um, had the had a vermicast type aspect to it. But we're talking about etheric energies, and it's just a different. There's something different about biodynamics, and um, yeah, so. Uh, I think they'd be very complementary to each other. Let's just say yeah, that. Yeah, it's my my thing is when we're compared, I say we're friends. <laughs> so and and like you know the the aim, you know, we put human terms on these things. They're just what we call them. But the aim of what we're trying to achieve is building life and, and energy, life force in the soil. Um, yeah. But there's always going to be different takes on how to do that. So um, complementary, definitely complementary. Um, when buying vermi extract products the viruses vary a lot well i suppose i don't know if you want to say on that that's different feedstocks makes a big difference in the way you extract it and things yeah yeah and i guess that's my presentation that i do is you know how do you know that you're getting value for money um are you getting a fertilizer a fertilizer are you getting a biostimulant um and i think it's get to know the people that make the worm product um make sure they feed a diverse um food source, um, make sure that um, they have some, some type of quality control system and we're working with Ash Martin at Microbe Labs Australia to work with the quality control system. Um, yeah, and just, you know, clean apparatus. So to be able to actually go there and have a look at it, to see how they make it, make sure there's no um, hidden secrets in how they make it, all those types of things give you reassurance that you're buying something that's quality. Okay, when separating worm farm, worms from castings, is the fungal content compromised? Yeah. 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 So anytime <laughs> we are, anytime we're um, kind of breaking stuff up, especially if you were putting that through uh, the trommel screen, that's really going to break it up. Um, if you were just using light or, um, or warmth to extract the worms, then no. If you are attracting worms to a feed source. So one thing we used to have is like um, apple bins, just the little ones, the crates, um, and fill that with something that worms really love. Like um, they really like bran and oats or, oh, they love avocados. Um, so if you have, I, I used to get avocado pulp and they just love that. So you could put that in a bin and then all the worms will move into that and then you can harvest that and then you're not disturbing that um, vermicast. Yeah. Uh, hormone content versus biological content is the next one. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, you could get that tested. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be expensive. Um, I, I'm more interested in just testing the biological content. Um, it's more economic um, that hormonal aspect is just it's part of what that biology is producing yeah um, somebody wants to know more about aluminium um, huh. right, right now we might not have time for that but yeah um, yeah get interested get interested in what's happening um, with yeah. the product and aluminium to start researching. There's some great questions um, and we're nearly running out of time. What are the products that contain the Neo? Think, Neo, Neo think that you never ever use on seed coating. Never so, ever. So uh, there's research. pretty much the seed treatments that are coming out now. So Comfador, Gaucho, mm. Poncho, um, Capstar. So yeah, it, neonicotinoids are the majority of um, insecticides now being put on seeds. So they are insecticides. Um, it was Bayer and Shell that got together on this one and just came up with this genius idea. Um, but yeah, uh, they're linking it to so many disorders now. Um, I don't know why it's still not banned. A lot of them um, have been banned. So, I mean, even the US has banned uh, a group of them, but yeah, most of them are, are still legal. Uh, some of them are banned for residential use. So yeah, get interested in and what's on those seed treatments and start to ask for the naked seeds. 
Yeah. All right. Do you have a recommended set of soil samples to conduct as a benchmark for starting a regenerative program and how often to retest a plot? Um, let's leave that for a, a yeah, that, that's a whole nother <laughs> Um What's happening, and it's just remarkable, is, is the questions aren't going down. So um, where we started with 48 <laughs> questions, um, there's no sense of achievement here because there's still we 48 still questions. <laughs> Um, which, you know, um, you know, means we, we, we won't go on forever and we'll, um, are you happy for us to, you know, record these questions and, and sort of see if we can group them into themes and, and if there's any, you know, feedback we can give after. Um, but, you know, there's not limitless time here or energy. <laughs> and it's just so exciting. Like it's, um, um, yeah, I, I just think it's, I think we've just got an absolute, feedback today um that people are interested in worms yeah way more yeah. way more than 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 you know yeah and culture yeah. realizes so um this is feels like a beginning more than uh, an end we, it's not the quintessential webinar of all webinars that will answer all questions and have all information but there's so much in there that i think that if, if some people look back on their question and look, sorry look back into the the webinar um, they'll probably find that um, a lot was covered there. So um, yeah. I think, yeah, I might draw it to a close and, and thank you again for all the information, the ideas, the, the evidence-based research that you've delivered. And something else I, I wanted to mention is, you know, in order to have this incredible response that we've had and interest in this, um, there was over 30 people, um, land cares, organisations, you know, um, you know, mostly Australian wide that have shared the, the, their interests. So this has not only been, you know, a Nutrisol customer base, but, you know, so many groups have really jumped on, you know, wanting to hear this, um, this information. So I thank all of those groups, I won't name them, for sharing in, in, in their um, networks and, um, and, yeah, making it the awesome event that it was. And, um, yeah, well... Anything, any closing comments, Nicola? No comments. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Nicole. It was great. Yeah, thanks, thanks you. guys. Well, I think, it, I think it's, I mean, we just did this for a bit of fun, but I think it's really showing that people are really interested. So I think probably Nutrisoil need to do a whole series on this and I need to <laughs> book on, on worms. Because I found yeah. that, yeah. There is quite a good one called Worm Farm Management, but it's really hard to get hold of. Like, it doesn't seem like it's still in print and it was an Australian book. Um, but yeah, I think I, I probably just need to sit down and write it with all that um, spare time I have. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thanks everybody. It was so generous to you give your time and, and ah, to get on this call so late at night and so early in the morning. Uh, so, I, and, and your comments have just been amazing. Thank you. I kind of want to print them off and put them on my yeah. wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, People I, like, I want to get out and, and feed my worms. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. right. Thank you to all 263 people that are still there listening. And um, I hope you have a great day or a great sleep, whatever part of the world that you're in. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.